Welcome to the third annual Innovations in Regulatory Science Summit, Movers and Shapers, the Future of Drug and Device Development. Our organizing committee has been working tirelessly for many months, and we think we have a very exciting and innovative program. I especially want to thank Kathy Giacomini, UCSF Stanford Searcy co-director, and Lawrence Lynn, who's done much of the heavy lifting for this meeting. The principal objective of this summit is to facilitate dialogue between all stakeholders and the innovation of safe and effective medical products. These stakeholders represent academia, industry, the FDA, other governmental agencies, as well as patient advocacy groups, as amongst others. The reason this meeting is held in January uh, is uh, that this is uh, precedes, the meeting precedes one of the largest healthcare conferences in the world. Uh, and many of these stakeholders are present in San Francisco at this time. Another summit objective is to highlight the power of CIRCE and regulatory science. And Kathy uh, Giacomini, as well as Tina Morrison, will be addressing this in a few minutes. And finally, we want to stimulate collaboration. And the networking that this type of meeting offers is, is tremendous. And those who attended the in person summit in 2020 on the UCSF campus can attest to the tremendous cross sector collaboration that this type of meeting allowed for. In 2021, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had to switch to a virtual format. This year, we hoped to have a hybrid virtual in-person meeting, but this uh, was not possible. But we still actively encourage audience participation, and uh, you'll see this box on the right side of your screen. Please send in questions as you think of them. No need to wait till the end of the sessions, and we'll address them as, uh, as we'll address as many of the questions as possible. This year's summit highlights include an overview of the UCSF Stanford Searcy, keynote addresses from FDA leaders, panel discussions on timely topics, remarks from Stanford and UCSF leaders, and concurrent short Searcy and FDA Center presentations in a breakout format. We're pleased to welcome back Janet Woodcock, Peter Marks, and Patricia Cavazzoni, who will give FDA keynote presentations. Janet's uh, presentation is entitled the near-term future of the FDA. Peter will speak to lessons learned from the pandemic, particularly with regard to the manufacturing of biologics. And Patricia will address regulatory pathways and inclusive clinical trials. Panel one uh, will, uh, is on issues and opportunities generated by accelerated approval. Uh, the FDA has been incredibly uh, flexible over the past year or two to deal with this pandemic that we've been, we've been facing. And and this particular panel will address confirmatory endpoints, evidence generation, and value. Panel two uh, will uh, speak to biomarkers and surrogate endpoints using Alzheimer's disease as a prototype. This has certainly been a hot topic over the past year, and we'll look at it from many different perspectives, the perspectives of scientists, clinicians, healthcare, economists, patient advocacy groups, amongst others. And then panel three uh, will be a unique opportunity to hear from five FDA commissioners, past and present, joined by Andy Plump, to discuss the future of the FDA. As I mentioned earlier, we have short Searcy and FDA Center presentations occurring concurrently in the afternoon. Room one will be biologics and big data, room two medical devices, and room three will address health disparities. We will then have a very special conversation with University of California President Michael Drake, moderated by our own Laura Esserman, and closing remarks from Deans Lloyd Minor and Talmadge King from Stanford and UCSF, respectively. We want to especially thank our sponsors uh, who have made it possible to once again offer this meeting without any registration fee. Uh, and we thank you for your support. And others who may be interested in sponsoring, please contact Lawrence. Uh, I'll have some information on this a little bit later in the program. I also especially want to thank uh, Janet Woodcock. Janet has been a tireless supporter of the Searcy concept and has been at, uh, a part of all three of our meetings. This, this meeting would not have been possible without Janet's support. It's almost five years to the day that Kathy and I met with Rob Califf for breakfast on a very cold morning in Palo Alto and when, when we discussed the concept of this meeting. Rob was incredibly supportive then as, and has continued to support this meeting both the idea as well as by participating in each of our summits. The UCSF Stanford Searcy is, is definitely a joint effort but by, uh, between two amazing institutions. And there's no more important time for this type of collaboration to address unmet biomedical needs. And both institutions are blessed by visionary leadership. UCSF Chancellor Sam Hoggood and Stanford President Mark Tessier-Levine have been su most supportive of the Searcy programs and have joined us 
now for the third consecutive year to make opening remarks. I'll ask Sam and Mark to make sequential opening remarks, uh, beginning with Sam. Sam, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Kulduv, and Happy New Year to you all. It's uh, wonderful to welcome you to 2022, uh, albeit uh, the third year now of our pandemic. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be with you again, and uh, this is always a bright start to each year. UCSF Stanford Searcy uh, is an incredible collaboration between the FDA and two premier academic institutions on the West Coast. I truly believe this collaboration is unique as faculty members at both institutions work together with FDA scientists in their public health mission. Now, during the last two years, we've seen clear examples of the FDA approving or authorizing the use of vaccines, diagnostics, and many novel therapeutic agents to address the pandemic. And the UCSF Stanford Searcy helped FDA and their mission. For example, and this is just a few uh, examples to uh, share with you, Atul Boot and his team at the Baker Computational Health Science Institute at UCSF are conducting a collaborative research with FDA scientists entitled Real World Population Characteristics, Safety and Effectiveness of COVID-19 Vaccines, in which they help mine data for the FDA to assess the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines in the real world. In another COVID-related research project funded through CERCI, Rahit Vashis and his team are working with the FDA scientists to examine real-world sex-specific clinical factors that influence the susceptibility to infections and outcomes amongst individuals infected with SARS-CoV-2. The FDA has also sponsored research through the CERCI to help engage diverse populations in clinical studies. Again, a few examples. Esteban Burchard, who will be speaking today, is conducting Circe supported research with the FDA focused on characterizing population specific clinical asthma profiles. Another example is Courtney Lyles and Umila Sakar, who have been assessing the impact of race and ethnicity on the response to heart failure reported outcome measures. And finally, Laura Esman and her team working with the FDA are streamlining our electronic health record systems to allow simple data entry for both clinical trial and healthcare. A more streamlined data entry system will allow healthcare systems, even in inner cities or rural populations, to participate in clinical trials, greatly increasing access for all Americans to the benefits of new medical therapies. So the unique collaboration that CERCI represents is a paradigm of multi-sector interactions involving two premier institutions in the Bay Area and the FDA. Today's summit reflects the multidisciplinary, multi-sector collaborations fostered by CERCI with speakers from the FDA, including FDA Senate directors, former commissioners, and scientists in both academia and industry. And I'm also delighted that Congresswoman Anna Eshu will be also joining us for panel one. I'm looking forward to the program and now hand it over to my friend and colleague, Mark Tessager Levin, president of Stanford University. At this point, we're going to ask Mark, uh, Mark Tessie Levine, who's been a tremendous supporter of, of our Circe meetings. Mark was present live in person in 2020 when we had our inaugural meeting, and he's joined us. He joined us in 2021, and he's here again this year to, to make some comments. Mark, turn it over to you. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Kuldev. And, um, and I, I hate to uh, um, interrupt the flow now that Peter has really uh, jumped into to the issues, but if you don't mind, I'll just step back uh, a little bit again to uh, uh, extend my welcome on behalf of, uh, and my thanks on behalf of all of us uh, at Stanford. Um, it, it really is so wonderful uh, to be gathered with so many scientists uh, and thinkers from across uh, academia, industry, and, and government. And although I know we all wish we could be there in person, um, uh, this event provides really uh, an outstanding and timely opportunity uh, to focus uh, on how to further medical innovation for the benefit of patients in need. 
Um, uh, we all know that um, the engines of medical innovation really um, uh, 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 are driven by the combined actions of the academic, the industry, and the regulatory and government sectors. Uh, by bringing all these sectors to the table, uh, this summit uh, will help us better understand the challenges and complexities involved in regulatory science and medical product development and advance our efforts to partner more effectively in, in the development, the approval, and the monitoring of medical products. Um, earlier, uh, Coldef uh, provided a terrific overview of the day ahead, and Sam also highlighted some of the very uh, tangible impacts of the UCSF Stanford Center of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, um, uh, and the, the impacts that uh, it's had in the past year. And so I just wanna make two additional points uh, to amplify their comments. Uh, first, I wanna underscore again, uh, the wisdom and the foresight of the FDA in creating the CIRCE program, which is such a thoughtful and innovative model of collaboration in all three of its areas of focus. Uh, in research, uh, programs are co-led by a PI from the FDA and a PI from one of our two academic institutions, and very uh, deliberately focused on mission critical projects that address FDA scientific needs. And the scientific exchange and education programs directly stimulate interactions between FDA scientists and academic scientists and train the next generation of young talent that will help take our medical innovation enterprise to the next level. Um, I really believe that the, the pro program was thoughtfully um, and very pragmatically designed to address key gaps in the biomedical translation infrastructure of our country. Uh, and its success should inspire us to ask, what other gaps are there in our country's infrastructure that we should seek to address with the same thoughtfulness and pragmatism? And this brings me to my second point. Uh, when we met a year ago at the first summit on innovations in regulatory science, uh, we discussed the many opportunities ahead for improving the translational ecosystem and in infrastructure. Uh, none of us foresaw, however, that COVID um, uh, would disrupt the world so profoundly harming people across the globe and laying bare glaring inequities and impacts and in access to healthcare for so many populations, both in our country and around the world. But as wrenching as this year has been, we've also had uh, been inspired by how our national and international biomedical communities, including um, academia, the private and philanthropic sectors and government responded with collective vigor, with innovation and partnership to combat the pandemic. Um, and what we've seen is a really um, a falling of the traditional barriers to collaboration uh, and advancing discovery and translation, uh, which has been a remarkable accomplishment in and of itself. Uh, and it provides an opportunity to learn how to reduce these barriers permanently for the next wave of innovation that's needed both for the, the current pandemic, which sadly, as we've just been discussing, continues to rumble along. Um, but also for the many, many other poorly treated diseases that will remain our focus as the pandemic uh, recedes. And, and that's what I'm inspired by. That's why I'm excited about uh, with this meeting today. And again, I want to thank Kuldef and all the organizers uh, of the meeting for bringing us together um, uh, for this. So thank you very much for the meeting. Thank you for having me. Um, and I look forward to an exciting day ahead. Thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for those wonderfully insightful comments and also for your support of Circe. Uh, I, I know you're passionate about this area and, and it really shows. And hopefully next year in 2023, we'll all be together again, live and in person uh, for, for the next summit. So first of all, I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm Kathy Giacomini and I'm co-principal investigator of the UCSF Stanford Circe which is sponsoring this very exciting event today, as Sam noted. I will be giving a short introduction about our CIRCE together with Dr. Tina Morrison, who is the Director of the Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation at the FDA, or ORCI. And it's ORCI that sponsors our CIRCE. So let me get the next slide. So just by way of background, I'd like to remind everyone that in spite of its name, um, FDA, get that up. In spite of its name, FDA regulates a vast array of healthcare products ranging from not only drugs to cell-based therapies to devices to digital health and so on. And all of its regulatory decisions and policies are based on science. So as you can imagine, regulatory science research is needed to develop those policies. And Sam gave some excellent examples in his opening remarks of some of that research. Um, 
Regulatory science research can be defined in multiple ways. We simply define it as research that helps regulators make better decisions. So to help FDA in their research, and Tina will talk more about this in the second half of this presentation, FDA harnesses the enormous research powerhouses of academia. And they do this through a variety of mechanisms. And I would say that one of their most successful mechanisms is the CIRCE program. FDA has established four CIRCE shown on this map. Ours is the only one on the West Coast and the one that is sponsoring today's event. However, all of the CIRCEs will be presenting research talks today at our lunchtime uh, research presentations. So one of the most exciting things about our CIRCE, and again, Sam mentioned this, is that we have a unique research collaborative model, at least unique for academia. We conduct collaborative mission-driven research with collaborations between UCSF and Stanford faculty and FDA scientists. So it's very fun and it's very productive when you partner an academic with an FDA scientist. The FDA scientist is very aware of their needs and has a public health mission. And when partnered with a faculty member who has the technology and the deep research knowledge, a lot of progress is made. Currently, we have 38 research projects in our CIRCE alone. All are collaborative and all are mission driven and focused on a range of FDA regulated medical products. And what is even more exciting is that our output may be very different from traditional academic output. So traditionally, academics conduct research and publish papers. But with the CIRCE projects, that output may extend beyond publications to actually informing regulatory guidances and policies. And that's very rewarding to see particularly for our students and our trainees who are often very engaged in these uh, uh, pro projects. So let me give you a few examples of research projects so you can get a feeling for the diverse array of projects that we are sponsoring. And Sam had given some in his opening remarks. So I'll quickly go through four. So as you know, gene editing is being increasingly investigated as a means to turn on or off particular targets in the genome to treat disease. But the tools which are engineered to make well-defined alterations in an intended target may also make unintended changes in other targets, so-called off-target effects. How do you figure out whether those off-target effects have occurred? And if so, where in the genome? Rigorous tools are needed to identify off-target effects of gene editing, and those tools need to be standardized for FDA to regulate those products. So Matthias Porteus at Stanford, working with FDA scientists, is comparing and standardizing distinct ways to discover and evaluate off-target effects of genome editing. Another project, and one that Sam cited, and I'll cite it too, because I love this particular project, is OneSource. Um, as many of you know, clinical trials are not truly accessible to most of the country. The majority tend to be conducted at a limited uh, number of well-established medical centers, limiting access to many people who may be disadvantaged because of their geographical location, because of their ethnicity or socioeconomic status. Laura Esserman at UCSF is working with FDA to improve electronic health systems for clinical trials and increase the accessibility for all. FDA cares deeply about hearing from patients when they evaluate a healthcare product. How do patients evaluate the benefits and risk of the new product? So we are sponsoring a number of projects across many, many medical products from faculty members such as Sean Mackey at Stanford. Sean is looking at opioid-based chronic pain treatments and asking patients how they feel about trading off less pain relief for less likelihood of addiction. Where's the sweet spot for the patient and how do we incorporate their desires into medical product approval? Finally, Atul Butte at UCSF and his team are working with FDA scientists to use the large University of California system-wide data warehouse that Atul and his group have created to evaluate safety and effectiveness of many products, including COVID vaccinations and other FDA regulated products. So that's just a brief taste of some of the projects that are going on in our CIRCE. It's very exciting. And you'll hear more about more about the other, pro uh, other projects going on today in our lightning talks. But in addition to research, 
We also have other activities of our CERSI, including some that you can participate in. We have an immersion course in drug development, the American course in drug development and regulatory sciences, fellowship programs sponsored by Genentech and Gilead, and a CERSI diversity scholar program. Here's our team. They're all fabulous. I would like to name all their names, but you can read them here. Um, it's a pure joy to work with everyone and our industry sponsors. And now let me turn it over to Tina, who will give the second part of this talk. Thank you, Kathy, Lawrence, and the UCSF Stanford Searcy for organizing and hosting the summit on innovations and regulatory science. I'm super delighted to be a part of it. Uh, the subject of innovation and regulatory science is very near and dear to the Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation in the Office of the Chief Scientist, who, in addition to you know, working alongside the regulators to protect public health, we are also dedicated to advancing public health by speeding innovations. And one way that we're trying to do that in ORSI is to establish these collaborative um, creative collaborative collaborations that harness the best science. And the CERCI program is certainly one of the ways in which we exemplify that vision. The Office of the Chief Scientist has been operating for almost 15 years, still serving its original statute of providing strategic leadership, coordination, expertise, and promoting scientific excellence and innovation to advance FDA's public health mission. The original Excuse me. The original cross-cutting priorities, which were set forth in the 2011 Advancing Regulatory Science Report, has served as the, as the foundation for advancing regulatory science programs in the Office of the Chief Scientist and continue to pave the way for cross-agency coordination, which also continues to strengthen our scientific capacity, infrastructure, and to foster a culture of resource sharing and collaboration. We also continue to partner with the FDA Science Board, who helps to shape the original FDA science mission and vision. FDA revisited this plan and provided a new platform for communicating the topics that need continuing and targeted investment for advancing regulatory science at FDA. These updates were provided just last year in the new Focus Areas of Regulatory Science report. And while this is not a comprehensive list of all of our research needs and priorities, it lists topics that are cross-cutting, which means they generally affect more than one office or center. And so stay tuned for this year's update in 2022. Our new target for FDA is to actually address what are our focus areas of regulatory science on a year-to-year -year basis in the same way that we address our priorities that are established for the CERCI program on a year-to-year -year basis. Our goal for this is to keep pace with the ever-changing science and technology priorities for our offices and centers that we support. An example of where the Office of the Chief Scientist continues to provide scientific excellence across FDA is through ORSI's leadership to support the FDA centers by fostering scientific research, innovation, and collaboration. I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about our regulatory science programs beyond the CERCI to show how they complement one another to advance uh, regulatory science at FDA. Our mission in ORSI is to provide excellence and innovation in strategic leadership, collaboration, coordination, and infrastructure development to ensure FDA continues to have a strong regulatory science foundation. That's the heart of what we do in ORSI. And we do this by running several programs. The first of which I want to share with you briefly is the scientific working group program. The scientific working groups, they enhance engagement and coordination across FDA and establish a forum that enables research and regulatory scientists to come together to discuss regulatory science gaps and needs and cross-cutting areas like modeling and simulation, artificial intelligence, advanced manufacturing, for example. One of the ways in which we're trying to strengthen the scientific working group program is actually to engage with the CERCI program. We've established three new projects with the CERCI through our scientific working groups, which is something new that we've done this year. To continue to spur innovation in the scientific community and to harness their knowledge, expertise, and infrastructure, in particular where areas 
where FDA has um, limited expertise or capacity, we host a contract mechanism for which FDA accepts novel ideas. Uh, from any science or technology-based firm. This could be academia, could be from nonprofits, uh, national or international laboratories. Um, and while this program has an ongoing enrollment, in order to meet our, the timelines of our fiscal year obligations, we recommend that our submitters uh, provide us with their ideas no later than January in that fiscal year. So the deadline for this year's program is January 21st. And our priorities uh, for the for that broad agency announcement are listed in a PDF on the SAMS.gov website. In addition to our extramural funding, we have an intramural funding program where we host five cross-cutting challenge areas. And in particular, the Chief Scientist Challenge Grant, it serves as an incubator for innovative ideas and enables FDA office science uh, offices and centers to harness creative approaches from their investigators to actually solve the priorities that are meeting, uh, that are need to be met for those centers and offices. And lastly, um, we have the CERCI program, which maybe on the surface may seem like solely an extramural funding source for academia. It's much more nuanced and collaborative. And, and I appreciate, Kathy, uh, and the details in which you provide not only that the CERCIs are a source for um, exchanging scientific ideas and how to tackle our most pressing regulatory science challenges. We do that beyond our research projects with training, education, and even mentorship. Um, we partner with these four institutions um, on an ongoing basis during our uh, five-year uh, grant cycle. Moreover, what's really important uh, for you all to know is that FDA invests heavily in regulatory science research. While we are not a typically a funding institution for, um, for traditional research, ORSI last year funded approximately $80 million to our partners through our broad agency announcement and through the CERCI program. Um, so it's important for the government regulatory body to to track and understand the impact of the regulatory science research that's ongoing at FDA. And the CERCI metrics model was established to do that. These nested metrics showcase that at the heart of this is advancing regulatory science. And as we travel along in time, along these nested trajectories, we aim to support and to share the scientific findings from these programs with, as Kathy alluded to, beyond publications, um, and presentations in the scientific community, which is traditionally at the heart of the um, academic institutions. Um, the CERCES are also engaged very much in training uh, FDA scientists and regulators in important scientific topics, raising the awareness of scientific education um, and expertise. Uh, and moving beyond that is to then catalyze action, maybe to help form a committee to develop a consensus standard or form a team to develop a qualified tool or serve to continue um, to advance the science by actually reaching out for additional funding um, to take the science to a new level. Uh, and lastly, we, we aim with the goal of this program and our regulatory science programs ultimately to find ways to inform the regulatory process and to inform regulatory decision making. And that can come in a variety of different ways, whether it's raising the expertise of the FDA regulators in terms of their scientific knowledge, updating a product's labeling, adopting a qualified tool or recognizing a consensus standard, or I think one of the things that many folks aim for with their scientific research is to establish a new policy or guidance in a rigorous way to help inform the regulatory process. But regardless of the outcomes of any one research project, we are working to increase regulatory science impact with the sole purpose to advance public health. And uh, while Kathy ended her slides with showcasing uh, the UCSF Stanford Searcy team, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to the FDA team that works tirelessly alongside the Searcy program um, on our side of the collaboration. Uh, the Searcy team is led by Dr. Rebecca Zinn. She's the Searcy program leader. She also serves as the program official for the Yale Mayo Searcy. Dr. Kanera Chadra, she's the program official for both Johns Hopkins University and the UCSF Stanford University. Doc, uh, Donna Bloom Kemilar, who is the University of Maryland program official. Um, our newest team members are Dr. Tracy Chen, who is our training, education, and scientific coordinator. 
uh, and Ms. Latoya Richardson, who serves as our executive assistant and our program manager for the program. So thank you uh, to our CERCI team at FDA um, and to our CERCI partners who are here with us today. I'll pass it back to you, Kathy. Thank you.